talk about burgers. I want to start with a story that very much frames how I've thought about Moon Burger and I think a lot about what I want to talk about today and I hope that we'll have an opportunity to talk about it in the lab later. It's a story that my father used to tell that just always delighted me when I was a kid. It was about when he was a kid, uh, he had a cousin named Bert, my second cousin. And every family gathering, my great-grandmother, Bert's grandmother, would make uh, chicken soup. And all you need to know about Bert is that he hated carrots. <laughs> and he loved pumpkin. And so this chicken soup, it was, a, it was a chicken soup. Well, you'd imagine broth and chicken and big pieces of carrots and other vegetables and whatever. So every time that my great-grandmother served this, Bert refused to eat it because he hated carrots. He wouldn't even touch the soup, you know, push it around the plate and... Finally, one Thanksgiving, she was fed up with this. She was like, I'm going to make Bert eat those carrots. She was crafty, strategic, enterprising. She went in the kitchen before she served the soup, and she blended up the carrots for Bert's portion. She poured it into his soup, and you can kind of imagine what that looked like. And she went up to the table, and she served everybody in the family the chicken soup. Everybody had theirs and, you know, with the pieces of carrots in there. And she came out and she said, Bert, I made something special for you. I made you pumpkin soup. And what do you think happened when he looked at that? He looked around at the rest of the table and everybody had their chicken soup with the pieces of carrots. And, and he looked down at his and it kind of looked like, a, you know, a, an orange stew. What do you think happened? He loved it. He loved it. He ate the whole thing, killed it. And forevermore, my great-grandmother would make... Everybody chicken soup with the carrots in it, and Bert got pumpkin soup, and it would just blend it up carrots. And he enjoyed it every single time, and he never knew. And in fact, I don't even know to this day if anybody's ever told him that that was the case, but I'm sure that, <laughs> that, that, um, that would create some sort of trauma in his life, so um, it's probably best not to. Um, but what I think about all the time that always delighted me when I was a kid is how much the context in which we consume has an impact on the way that we pursue, perceive what it is that we are consuming. And so with that, let's talk about burgers. When I talk about cause marketing today, I'm using the term broadly. So cause marketing meaning any time that a, uh, a company, primarily for-profit, uh, as opposed to a non-profit, but certainly we can talk about definitions, but broadly speaking, any time a company is invoking a social and environmental cause in its brand or its messaging, and that could be something as simple as a mission-based company that has a tag on their product packaging that says something like uh, ethically or sustainably sourced. Or that could be something that you know, goes into the kind of traditional Q, uh, CSR space of uh, a Walmart um, you know, do, running a promotion in which you know, for, for the month of March, a dollar from every sale is going to the uh, American Heart Association. And kind of everything in between. And there are a lot of mission-based companies in this room. And so I know that a lot of folks think about this and do this in their messaging and marketing. And so the premise here is not that cause marketing is all good or all bad. It's how can we think about it in the most strategic way possible for the end in which we are trying to achieve. And look at ourselves in the mirror and say, what is the purpose of what we're doing and what is the real outcome? So what's the problem here? Americans love beef. Americans love burgers. Uh, in the fast food space, and I use that term broadly to mean the QSR space, quick serve, McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, kind of traditional fast food, as well as the fast casual space, Shake Shack, Five Guys, etc. By far the biggest category, burger restaurants, and projected to grow tremendously over the next 10 years. One inconvenient problem with that Beef, and I suspect this is not a surprise to anyone in this room, beef is the single greatest contributor to climate change in the food system and the greatest uh, use of land and water. That's a problem. We need to reduce our consumption of beef and factory farmed meat in order to create a sustainable future. That's just a fact. There are a handful of ways in which we can do that, and there are different schools of thought. There's only, there are different schools of thought. There's only one right school of thought. One is that we need to increase 
consumption in the mainstream of plant-based meat. That's a way to reduce, obviously, consumption of beef. If you can actually get people to swap out some of the meat they were consuming and instead eat a plant-based protein. Another is uh, regenerative farming. Small, local farms, really important. The challenge with the push for regenerative farming, and I know there are folks in here who do a lot of work in that space, it is critically important, it's that 99% of the meat consumed in this country is factory farmed. So while you may exist in a space in which in your community, the people that you surround yourself with shop at places like Whole Foods and Erewhon, and it may feel like a foregone conclusion that yes, everybody believes that we need to eat local, we need to eat whole fruits and vegetables, we need to eat sustainably farmed meat. It is a very, very tiny bubble in America. So even if you 5X or 10X the number of regenerative farms that are producing beef or other meat for consumption in this country, it's still a tiny part of the problem. Another school of thought is, this is my favorite, let's just get everybody to eat more whole vegetables. That's a great idea. That's the best idea. If you could wave a wand and just tell Americans, eat less meat, eat more vegetables, that'd be pretty powerful. 80% of American households 80% of American households eat fast food at least once a week. So the idea that we can just, through education and even expanding access to fresh fruits and vegetables dramatically, could create the change that we need in the time that we need it, is, and I want to say this as gently as possible, totally ludicrous. And so we have to be realistic about the problem. So what I said, there's only one right solution. The only right solution here is an all the above strategy. Not, not, not one of those particular avenues to reducing consumption of meat in America is the solution. Plant-based meat is not perfect. There are lots of problems with it. But we need to invest in that as a critical part of the solution. And so is uh, investing in reforming farming practices, re investing in regenerative farming investing in education, uh, getting, encouraging people to eat more fruits and vegetables, expanding access in communities in which access is limited, all of those things. The second part of the problem is that in order to, and I'm going to talk largely about the first piece of that, right, which is reducing meat consumption by increasing consumption of plant-based meat. The problem is that the fast service Industry is moving at a crawl. This is a scary photo. Very ominous. Um, moving at a crawl to address the problem. There's a spectrum. On one side, you have all of the traditional QSRs, the McDonald's, the Wendy's, the Burger Kings. You have the fast casuals like the Shake Shacks, like the Five Guys, they're all slowly adding plant-based items to their menus. On the other side of the spectrum, you have a bunch of small, fully vegan fast food change, chains, which are awesome. All of them, collectively, are primarily targeting people who are already bought in, who already are eating plant-based, who identify as vegetarian or vegan, or who have already have an interest in that. Maybe they're flexitarian and kind of would self-identify as flexitarian. What you don't have is something confidently in the middle, truly reaching the mainstream with a plant-based product and getting people who otherwise love meat to try the thing and then return. I want to talk about how this is positioned. So these are all views pulled from the packaging or the home pages of the leading uh, plant-based fast food chains in America. And I want to be clear, these are all people who we fully support. What they're doing, they are our friends. Um, and we've removed logos and names here. We just want you to focus on the message. But I want to give you a chance to look at this. And you can see how much focus there is on the cause in the message. Is there anything up there that doesn't say something about a cause? Now let's look at 
the way that the predominant chains in America position their, their plant-based offerings. Again, a little bit different, a little bit less cause-focused, but everything says plant-based, 0% uh, beef, meat made from plants. Let's talk about how these, this type of positioning might or might not resonate with particular parts of America. What is that guy thinking? I don't want to generalize, but let me generalize for a second. Is that guy driving past Burger King and saying, hold up, put it in reverse. Did that just say 0% beef? Because I woke up this morning dreaming about 0% beef. Or drive by McDonald's and say, that McPlant, I've been thinking about the McPlant all week. And so I hope I don't have to convince anybody in the room that all the way that, uh, the, the ways in which all of those brands are positioning is primarily targeted at people who are already bought in. There is a way to do it, to reach the mainstream. And Moonberger's proof, and I'm gonna talk about what we've done. I left uh, a job running a corporate PR firm in New York City after 13 years a wonderful place, loved what I was doing, loved the people I work with, loved our clients, just ready for a new opportunity, new challenge, new life experience. I left with no plan. I was very fortunate to be able to give myself six months off, just not even think about what I was gonna do. And I uh, uh, woke up one day with the idea for Moonburger. And I think it'd be nascent in my mind. Shake Shack was a client of mine for about 10 years. I've been thinking about this, that we're not projecting far enough into the future for the way the world is gonna change. History is filled with examples of companies that had significant scale and just failed to read the writing on the wall. Blockbuster, Toys R Us, any, any number of other examples. There had to be a better way to reach the mainstream than what's currently happening, and if we don't do it, we're in trouble because it's existential. We have to move toward a future in which we are consuming less beef and less meat. And so how could we do it? And by the way, for all my capitalists in the room, it also happens to mean that there is a significant market opportunity because nobody else is doing it. So we set out to do it. it. When I looked at the landscape, you know, kind of looked at those slides and the way that everybody was positioning it, it almost was like somewhere written in the Constitution or maybe the Bible, there was some line that said, if you are a plant-based product, you have to have the word plant-based in your headline in 35-point font or bigger, or you're not really plant-based. But why? Does that need to be the headline? Maybe, but to what end? And who does that resonate with? And so it's one of those moments, and I think, and I would occur just as an aside, we all have these moments throughout, I think, normal course of life where you think of an idea and you're like, nobody else is doing it that way. I must know, I must, do I know something that other people don't or am I a moron? Like, am I missing something? Because there must be a reason that everybody else is doing it this way and has been doing it this way for a long time. I would just encourage you, when you have those moments, stick with them. Because you probably know something that other people don't. So we started Moonburger. This got a little distorted. But based on six key pillars, I'm just go through these quickly. First, food and experience, period. You will see nothing about the cause in our message, in our positioning for consumers. We are totally transparent about what we are serving, but you won't see anything about the environment, human health, animal welfare, plant-based, the word vegan, anything like that. Those are all prejudicial terms. And I wanna be honest, and I'll, I'll, I'll be vulnerable for a second. Even me who totally believes in all the causes, when I go to a spot and I see something like a burger for a better world, I think that burger tastes a little less good because I'm like, what did they have to sacrifice in order to do the thing better for the world? And so if me, as somebody who already believes strongly and I'm doing this thing because of the cause feels that way, imagine somebody who doesn't care about the issue or even more, somebody who is actively turned off by the issue who says, screw climate change, I don't care. Food and experience, period. If you care about it, you know. Do electric car manufacturers at this point need to say electric car better for the environment? If that's why you're buying an electric car, you get it. I don't have to tell you that. If you're somebody who doesn't care about the environment, 
and, that, and you're buying an electric car for another reason, it's performance, it's speed, it's luxury, it's all those things. It's human self-interest. It's a simple equation. We create a distinctive brand that hits the notes between classic and, uh, and nostalgic and future forward. We have a hybrid approach. What I mean by that is we have dairy on our menu, which is critical for adoption by the mainstream, people who love meat. Our classic cheeseburger, and hopefully you'll be able to try it later today, um, is made with dairy cheese by default. We have an awesome vegan option for our vegan friends uh, with plant-based cheese, but it's a hybrid approach now. I think about it as the car market, you know, 10 years ago, we needed the hybrid to pave away for the full electric. We have to meet people where they are and take them on a journey. I'm not gonna talk about efficiency. Um, price, very important. The only way something like this could ever be successful for reaching the mainstream is if it feels like fast food. And how does it feel like fast food? It's gotta be accessible. It's the right thing to do, and it's the only way that you can increase adoption. So our burger costs $6.89. We wanted to get it to the price point of a Five Guys burger, Five Guys single, when we opened. You won't find a burger made with Impossible anywhere else in the country short of Burger King at that price point, usually eight, nine, 10, $15, I'm sure you've all seen. Finally, location. Where we are in the Hudson Valley, Kingston, New York, um, is strategic in that, number one, we get to do what we set out to do, which is reach a suburban or exurban audience with something that is not a shoe in for those communities typically, and see if we can do that there and prove the model. But also, we get all the visibility of people coming up from New York City, weekenders, Kingston is very much in the center of that zeitgeist. We have an awesome team. It all starts with team. I hope you'll be able to meet some folks uh, later today uh, at the, um, when we're serving Moon Burgers over at the spot. And by the way, I should say about price, that accessible pricing does not apply over here. <laughs> we, we, uh, we had to bring up a lot of team members, so I hope that we all can just agree to, to consider this the Moon Burger <laughs> Airport location, because um, uh, we, <laughs> we got expenses to cover. Um, all starts with the team. Uh, we, we, we want to invest in our people first and foremost. Without that, we have nothing. Provide good jobs, um, provide paths to, uh, to cor true career paths. And our management team is almost entirely made up of first-time managers. We want to invest in people and educate them along the way. We don't want it to be a requisite that you've had to go to a management school like Cornell or Johnson & Wales and have experience in hospitality uh, professionally because I think that's a barrier. We have an awesome group of uh, advisors and our culinary team, some big heavy hitters. Emil Stonic led our many development, Allison, together with Allison Roman, Anup Polarasetti sitting over here. Um, these are some of the greatest culinary minds in the country, uh, recipe developers, and we're very fortunate to have them. Very simple menu. Burgers, fries, and shakes. Keep it familiar. That's all you need. What does the menu look like? Burgers, fries, and shakes. And so you'll see here, it says meatless, griddled impossible patty next to each item. So we don't want to trick anybody. We want people to know what they're getting. There are plenty of people who pull up maybe for the first time at Moonburger and are discovering it when they drive up because we are fully drive through to that menu and see. They might say, mm, you know, I wasn't that interested in this. I didn't realize it was plant based, but there was nothing prejudicial that, that kept them from pulling up where they would just drive by and said, I'm not even going to check it out. So they come up. And they try it and they say, you know what? That was really good. And then they become weekly customers. We keep it familiar. Coke products. We don't have anything fancy. There's nothing precious about this. This is fast food. Talk about brand. The experience is just as important as anything else. It's the food and experience. And I want to show you a couple of... I thought it was friggin' meat, man. This guy's telling me it wasn't meat, but wow, it was delicious. It tastes just like meat. I thought it was meat. I can't believe it. We were comparing it to the burgers back at home. We're like, this is better than X, Y, and Z. <laughs> oh, it was. I was backing up. I was telling you, let's get out of here. It's plant-based. And I said, no. They are really good. Thank really you so good. much. We came back within five minutes. That's the five minutes. The only problem with this is that the burgers were too damn good. Oh, five Guys is all right too, but this, but I like this better. Moonburger's the best. It's probably, the best I've ever had probably the best cheeseburger I've ever had in my life. All of these people, thank you for, for, for these folks. All these people tried plant-based for the first time at Moonburger. 
And by, by the way, Ernesto and Carmen, who we met here, came up from the Bronx, Bronx, New York. Uh, I, I, <laughs> Ernesto said, I got one more thing to say. And he said that last piece. I was like, you can't say that. Nobody's going to think that you, we put you up to this. Uh, when he said the thing about uh, burgers are too damn good. Um, but all these folks tried it for the first time. And you even saw with Ernesto and Carmen what happened there. And you probably got this from the video is they had pulled up and they saw plant based. And he was like, let's get out of here. And she said, let's try it because we're here. And then they tried it. They ate the burgers and they literally came back a second time because they said, we're going to bring it to folks back home. We can be different things to different people. These are people who stumbled on Moonberg because they're driving by and we are between two gas stations right off the New York State Thruway. It is as fast food as you can get. We also have folks who come to Moonberg as a destination. We're very fortunate to get lots of great press, have lots of great social media, people love to post, people love the brand. It's awesome. And we can be something different to those people. And perhaps they're, the, if you know, you know, and they're bought into the cause and that's great and those things can coexist. So what's next? Uh, as I mentioned, we've been fortunate to get some great press. Uh, we are opening our second location in New Paltz, about 20 minutes away in about a month, um, which will be terrific. And I'll announce for the first time here uh, that, and I realize this is not off the record and we're talking to the internet as well, um, but <laughs> it's off the record. Um, we are, uh, We've been working on a deal for our third location, which hopefully will be open in the early fall, and we are going to put Moonberg at a gas station. And we are reasonably sure that that will be the first plant-based spot at a gas station in America. And to me, the idea with that is, get, first of all, getting access to a space in which normally you go into a gas station and it is a Dunkin' Donuts that coexists in that convenience store, right, is we were very lucky to be able to work at a deal where we could get access to that space because typically brands like ours would not be able to. But what is more American than being at a gas station, meeting people where they are? And so we will make that a gas station experience like no other. We will make it a destination for people who want to come to Moonberg and eat at the gas station because you're going to go into a space and step through a threshold and you will be in Moonberg or inside this space. But just as much, all those folks who are pulling up just to fill up gas can come in and we have a drive through there and it'll be terrific. And I like to say to folks, you will not find a plant-based brand in America that has more guys in pickup trucks who pull through, try it, and then return and come back and be regular customers. So we're very excited about what the possibility is. We also, in that deal, were able to work out um, an agreement in which the gas station operators will electric car charge into that gas station. So it's a nice way to help to usher us forward in the future. So I'm going to wrap up with that. Um, thank you all so much uh, for giving this a listen. I so look forward to talking to you all more uh, uh, throughout the afternoon. Thank you.